Young Men as Missionaries. Young men who desire to enter the field as ministers, coal porters, or canvassers should first receive a suitable degree of mental training as well as a special preparation for their calling. Those who are uneducated, untrained, and unrefined are not prepared to enter a field in which the powerful influences of talent and education combat the truths of God's Word. Neither can they successfully meet the strange forms of error, religious and philosophical combined, to expose which requires a knowledge of scientific as well as scriptural truth. Those who especially have the ministry in view should feel the importance of the scriptural method of ministerial training. They should enter heartily into the work, and while they study in the schools, they should learn of the great teacher, the meekness and humility of Christ. A covenant-keeping God has promised that in answer to prayer, his spirit shall be poured out upon these learners in the school of Christ, that they may become ministers of righteousness. There is hard work to be done in dislodging error and false doctrine from the head, that Bible truth and Bible religion may find a place in the heart. It was as a means ordained of God to educate young men and women for the various departments of missionary labor that colleges were established among us. It is God's will that they should send forth not merely a few, but many laborers. But Satan, determined to overthrow this purpose, has often secured the very ones whom God would qualify for places of usefulness in his work. There are many who would work if urged into the service and who would save their souls by thus working. The church should feel her great responsibility in shutting up the light of truth and restraining the grace of God within her own narrow limits when money and influence should be freely employed in bringing competent persons into the missionary field. Hundreds of young men should have been preparing to act a part in the work of scattering the seeds of truth besides all waters. We want men who will push the triumphs of the cross, men who will persevere under discouragements and privations, who will have the zeal and resolution and faith that are indispensable in the missionary field. Subheading of Foreign Languages There are among us those who, without the toil and delay of learning a foreign language, might qualify themselves to proclaim the truth to other nations. In the primitive church, missionaries were miraculously endowed with a knowledge of the languages in which they were called to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And if God was willing thus to help his servants then, can we doubt that his blessing will rest upon our efforts to qualify those who naturally possess a knowledge of foreign tongues and who, with proper encouragement, would bear to their own countrymen the message of truth? We might have had more laborers in foreign missionary fields had those who entered these fields availed themselves of every talent within their reach. It may in some cases be necessary that young men learn foreign languages. This they can do with most success by associating with the people and at the same time devoting a portion of each day to studying the language. This should be done, however, only as a necessary step preparatory to educating such as are found in the missionary fields themselves, and who with proper training can become workers. It is essential that those be urged into the service who can speak in their mother tongue to the people of different nations. It is a great undertaking for a man of middle age to learn a foreign language, and with all his efforts it will be next to impossible for him to speak it so readily and correctly as to render him an efficient laborer. We cannot afford to deprive our home missions of the influence of middle age and aged ministers to send them into distant fields to engage in a work for which they are not qualified and to which no amount of training will enable them to adapt themselves. The men thus sent out leave vacancies which inexperienced laborers cannot supply. Subheading, Young Men Wanted for Hard Places the church may inquire whether young men can be entrusted with the grave responsibilities involved in the establishing and superintending of a foreign mission. I answer, God designed that they should be so trained in our colleges and by association and labor with men of experience that they would be prepared for places of usefulness in this cause. We must manifest confidence in our young men. They should be pioneers in every enterprise involving toil and sacrifice, while the overtaxed servants of Christ should be cherished as counselors to encourage and bless those who strike the heaviest blows for God. Providence thrust these experienced fathers into trying responsible positions at an early age when neither physical nor intellectual powers were fully developed. 
The magnitude of the trust committed to them aroused their energies in their active labor and the work aided both physical and mental development. Young men are wanted. God calls them to missionary fields. Being comparatively free from care and responsibilities, they are more favorably situated to engage in the work than those who must provide for the training and support of a large family. Furthermore, young men can more readily adapt themselves to new climate and new society and can better endure inconveniences and hardships. By tact and perseverance, they can reach the people where they are. Strength comes by exercise. All who put to use the ability which God has given them will have increased ability to devote to his service. Those who do nothing in the cause of God will fail to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the truth. A man who would lie down and refuse to exercise his limbs would soon lose all power to use them. Thus the Christian who will not exercise his God-given powers not only fails to grow up into Christ, but he loses the strength which he already had. He becomes a spiritual paralytic. It is those who, with love for God and their fellow men, are striving to help others, they become established, strengthened, settled in the truth. The true Christian work is for God, not from impulse, but from principle, not for a day or a month, but during the entire life. The Master calls for gospel workers. Who will respond? Not all who went to the army are to be generals, captains, sergeants, or even corporals. Not all have the care and responsibility of leaders. There is hard work of other kinds to be done. Some must dig trenches and build fortifications. Some are to stand as sentinels, some to carry messages. While there are but few officers, it requires many soldiers to form the rank and file of the army. Yet its success depends upon the fidelity of every soldier. One man's cowardice or treachery may bring disaster upon the entire army. He who has appointed to every man his work, Mark 13, 34, according to his ability, will never let the faithful performance of duty go unrewarded. Every act of loyalty and faith will be crowned with special tokens of God's favor and approbation. To every worker is given the promise, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalms 126, 6. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 390 to 395. Many a lad of today, growing up as did Daniel in his Judean home, studying God's Word and His works, and learning the lessons of faithful service, will yet stand in legislative assemblies, in halls of justice, or in royal courts as a witness for the King of Kings. Multitudes will be called to a wider ministry. The whole world is opening to the gospel. Ethiopia is stretching out her hands unto God. From Japan and China and India, from the still darkened lands of our own continent, from every quarter of this world of ours comes the cry of sin-stricken hearts for a knowledge of the God of love. Education, page 262.